My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Strong faith comes from knowing and believing that Jesus Christ not only rose from the dead, but he defeated the devil. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. Strong faith comes from meditating on God's word. Strong faith is cultivated and developed when you not only read the word of God, but you internalize it. You ponder on it and dwell on it. When you think about some of the heroes of faith in the Bible and all the trials they went through, you'll see that all of them had one thing in common. They were unshakable in their faith. They were strong in faith. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, but he held on to God. Paul and Silas were beaten, chained up, and imprisoned, but they still praised God. Moses stood in front of the Red Sea and called on God. These are all great examples of men who stood their ground and trusted in the Lord, even when all the odds were against them. No matter what they faced, their faith was not shaken. Their faith was not broken because they knew that the God whom they served is bigger, greater, and more powerful than anything or anyone else who they could come up against. We can learn a lot from the believers in the Bible and from how they dealt with adversity. Because even in present day, we often find ourselves in situations where our faith is put to the test. And we must decide how we will respond. Your trial may not look like theirs. Your trial may not be a den of hungry lions or being chased by an Egyptian army into an enormous body of water, but it seems just as hopeless and just as intimidating when you're in the thick of it. Maybe you're facing persecution for your faith. Maybe past hurts have created a feeling of resentment toward God. Maybe the enemy is causing you to doubt the goodness of God. No matter what your hardship may be, be strong in faith. Don't allow yourself to be moved. Because as soon as you let go of God's promises, you are bound to get swept up into the madness of this world. Jesus Christ is the only sure foundation in this fickle and ever-changing world. He is our steadfast anchor. Circumstances change. People change. Social norms and public perceptions change. But the Word of God remains true forever. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's why we can stand confidently in him. That's why we can cling to him when we feel like we're slipping away into the chaos of life. And he will rescue us and place our feet back on solid ground. What does it mean to be unshakable in your faith? It doesn't mean never having doubts. It doesn't mean never being afraid. It simply means that when trouble comes our way, we don't panic. We don't lose hope. We don't turn to the world or to ourselves for answers. Instead, we are able to rest in the promises of God. The thing that Daniel and Paul and Moses was that they understood the stakes. They understood that even if nothing went their way, even if they ended up suffering deeply, it would be worth it. Because knowing Jesus was so valuable, so precious to them. Can the same be said for you? Do you treasure Jesus above your own life? Is he worthy? And he wants you to experience abundant life by trusting him and obeying his word. So when trouble comes your way, stand firm. Be unswayable. Be immovable. Be unshakable.
I've been through storms. I've felt pain. I've been hurt. I've asked God, where are you? And even though the storm was hard to go through, it taught me something. It taught me to trust in Jesus. It taught me to pray. It taught me to stand. With nothing left but faith, just faith. And like the song says, through it all, I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I have learned to depend on his word. And guess what? He's never let me down. It's easy to be defined by one moment in life. Some people are defined by a failed relationship, a failed business venture, a divorce even, a career-ending injury. But in the Bible, the devil is called the accuser. And he would love to convince you that because of that one mistake, because of that one failure, because of that one season, you should begin to look down on yourself. But let me tell you that no matter the mistake you've made, God's plan will still prevail. God's will will still be done. God knew your end from your beginning. He knew all of your highs and your lows. He numbered your good days to exceed your bad days. You might have failed, but you are not a failure. You might have had some bad choices, but that's not who you are. You might have an issue or two, but you are not your issue. And you see the enemy as an accuser will constantly throw negative labels to try and define you. He'll call you things like an addict, a failure, a loser, a dropout. But the word of God calls you redeemed. It calls you a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are washed and made clean by the blood of Jesus. You are healed by his stripes. You are the head and not the tail. Don't let the devil label you. He does not determine your destiny. Refuse the labels that other people try to stick on you. Never believe the lies of the accuser. You are not defined by your mistakes, but by what God says about you. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are saved by his amazing grace. So move forward. Your mistakes are in the past and God is in your future. There are times we need to take authority over spiritual forces and be delivered and set free from the oppressive powers of the enemy. Since the beginning of time, the devil's been going around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And I want to make this very clear. Our enemy, the devil, is the accuser of the brethren. He is a liar, the father of lies. In fact, deception is his game, and he plays it well. Now, what he tries to do is, if he can get you to live in fear, he knows that he has won the battle. And over the years, I have come to know people, some believers even, whose lives were filled with a tormenting and fearful spirit. And I want you to understand that God does not put you in bondage, but fear does. God holds you in pure love, but fear will hold you in bondage. Remember Job? He said, The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. If you allow the spirit of fear to take root in your life, it gives birth to a lot of things. To live in fear is like being caught in a snare. It's like a bird caught in a net. And if your life is ruled by fear, you will be held captive in that snare, waiting for something that will never happen to happen. But I've got some good news for you. Can God deliver us from fear? Yes, he can. Can the Lord Jesus give us freedom and peace? Yes, he can. Can the Lord be our shining light, a light that destroys the darkness of fear? Yes, he can. Speak over your life if you're feeling fearful. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
So as a child of God, I need to come to the understanding that for me to be an effective servant in God's kingdom, I have to overcome fear. I have to believe what God's word says concerning fear. I have to believe who God says I am. Overcoming fear will help reach my potential and exercise my rights as a born-again believer and as a joint heir with Christ. Fear normally starts as a thought that grows and grows until it, until it controls us. This thought can be from anything, but when you dwell on it, when you constantly think of it and relive it, it becomes a spirit of fear. It's important as a believer to guard our thoughts in order to overcome this spirit. Positive, godly thinking is encouraged, always bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, the Bible says. Meaning we have to be in control of our thoughts so that they don't stray. It's important to know that God is with you once you have received Jesus. To begin with, let me tell you that not every storm, not every crisis, not every challenge or problem is bad for you. What I mean is that some situations we encounter, yes, they'll be difficult. They will be painful. But in the long run, that storm, it will be for your good. That crisis will work out for your good. That challenge will make you stronger. You see, someone will get sick, but recover in such a way that they can only acknowledge the hand of God, the miracle working power of the blood of Jesus. Someone's plans will get disrupted only to find that that disruption led them to a better destination. Someone's plans will get delayed, but that's perhaps God's way of saying, not yet. I have something better in store. I have a better time in mind. Every crisis in life is not bad for you. Sometimes God uses adversity. God places you in tough situations only for you to grow, for you to develop stronger faith, for you to mature. So the next time a problem presents itself, the next time you face a crisis, just stop for a moment and ask God, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want to develop within me? I love the story of Jesus walking on water to his disciples. It's a story that tells us what to do when it feels like you're going under. It's a story that we can use as a reference when we come face to face with a ravaging storm in our lives. The Bible says in Matthew 14, verse 22 to 27, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Before I go any further, I would like to stop and highlight the sequence of events here. Verse 24, the storm began because the Bible says, For the wind was against them. Verse 26, when the disciples see Jesus, Note their reactions. The Bible says they were terrified and they cried out in fear. Verse 27, Jesus responded saying, Take heart, it is I. 
do not be afraid. Now, perhaps you've never experienced this, but I certainly have faced stormy situations in my life. And I can admit, I felt terrified, just like the disciples. At the sight of a storm, at the first sign of something that I'm unfamiliar with or uncertain about, I have been attacked by the spirit of fear, just like the disciples here. But saints, I believe the words that Jesus spoke to the disciples many years ago are still as relevant today as they were back then. We need to take heart, to be bold, and to have courage, we need not be afraid. The very thing that the disciples were afraid of, the very thing that filled them with fear was their savior. The Bible says when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. They were afraid of the manner in which Jesus was coming to them. Now consider this. Could God be coming into your life through what appears to be a storm? Could the Lord be working in the storm, through the storm, and in the storm, so that he can get closer and closer to you? Could he be saying, the storm you think will destroy you is the very thing I will use to strengthen you, to uplift you, to bless you. Take heart, saints. Do not be afraid. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Job 13, verse 15, where he says this about God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own way before him. Think about what measure of faith, what measure of assurance you need to have to be able to say the words, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Those are fighting words. Those are strong words. No matter what comes, no matter what happens to me, I will trust in Jesus. I pray to have faith like Job. Faith that stands in the face of total despair, total loss and destruction, but still say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. How I desire to reach that level of maturity as a Christian. How I pray that when my season of testing comes, Lord help me to plant my feet, to square my shoulders, roll up my sleeves and boldly confess, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I look at the story of Job as a unique example of faith under fire. Here was a wealthy and upright man who had everything going for him, but the devil entered the picture. He claimed that if Job's faith was placed under fire, he would curse God. But God allowed Job's faith to stand trial. The Lord allowed Job's faith to be tried under fire. So he lost his livestock, he lost his family, and he even lost his health, afflicting him with skin boils or sores. God allowed this to happen in order to test Job and to prove to Satan that Job was a good man, regardless of his circumstances. Job was understandably driven to a very dark place, and many of us can relate. We've been there. We've all been at that point where our faith is tried. We've all been to a place that has left us in some kind of distress, a place where you can feel as though this is completely rock bottom and Job felt as if life had no meaning. He felt as though life was not worth living anymore. Even his friends judged and condemned him by implying that he was not a godly man and that he deserved what happened to him. Even his wife told him that he should just curse God and die. Talk about feeling truly alone. But I admire Job for ignoring those around him. I admire Job for taking the stance of saying, though he slay me, yet will I trust him something many of us need to start practicing. Job didn't listen to the naysayers or the discouragers, nor did he take their advice. He remained strong in faith. Although he was feeling down in despair and depression, he remained strong in faith. 
Although he had so many questions for God, although he didn't fully understand why God had allowed all of this to happen to him, Job still feared the Lord. He still trusted in the Lord. Job still said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, will you have the same approach? Will you have the same stance as Job? Will you remain strong and firm in faith when your faith is under fire? Lately, I've found myself praying for things that you can't buy with money. My prayer request has been, God, give me peace of mind. Lord, take worry and anxiety away. Father, protect me. Protect me every time I leave the house. Protect my health. Protect my home. Every single one of my prayer requests have been for things that money can't buy. And I have been trying to make sense of all the various tests I've encountered. The challenges that have come to meet me head on. But then I have been reminded that Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So I am coming to understand that my plans will not have any success unless God governs them all. I'd like to encourage you to be bold. Too many Christians are timid and feeble because they don't know the power and authority that they have in Jesus. But may I remind you that Luke chapter 10 verse 19 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Hold on to this verse. Hold on to this promise and let it stir your spirit. No longer should you be fearful and timid. Jesus Christ has given you authority, the authority to trample on the devil and his demons. He has given us the authority to overcome all power of the enemy. And so I simply want you to know that it is not your portion to be fearful as a child of God. It is not your portion to be a timid Christian, but Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings has said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So let this be the reason that you pray with power. Let this be the reason you pray with boldness. And here's what I want you to do. When you think of power, think of prayer. And when you think of prayer, think of power. More prayer, more power. If you want more power, pray more. Prayer binds us with God. Prayer empowers us to be able to live out Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Life is full of changes and challenges, but God governs them all. We cannot do a thing without God's counsel, having approved it. So now as I begin to not just understand that it's God's plan that governs things and not my plan, I begin to have faith. I begin to have faith that if Jesus can turn the cold heart of a man who used to hunt Christians, if he can turn Saul, the persecutor, to Paul the Apostle, then he can change me from being weak in my mind to being strong. He can change me from being just someone on this earth to become someone significant for his kingdom. I begin to have faith because if Jesus discovered a woman at the well and then gave her living water, then he can do it for me too. He can give me more faith instead of fear. He can give me more peace instead of worry, more joy instead of sadness, 
If Jesus can feel the touch of a desperate believer on the hem of his garment, then surely he can feel my pain. He can feel the weight that I am carrying. God has a plan for your life and a plan for my life. We can abide by his plan or we can try and go against it and do what we want to do. The problem with doing our own thing or following our own plan is that we will have to face the consequences. And I would rather follow God's plan than do my own thing without God's counsel. So now the question becomes, my plans or God's plans? You see, the thing about faith is we act in faith when there is no guarantee, no certainty. No one knows what kind of life a child will have, yet people continue to have children. No one can know how life with your spouse will turn out, yet we continue to have faith that our relationships will last a lifetime. And here is why it sometimes may be difficult or scary to follow God's plan. Believing in God always requires action before manifestation. Faith acts before it happens. In Exodus 14, verse 16, Moses had to lift up his rod and stretch out his hand over the sea for it to divide. He didn't get to the Red Sea and it was already parted. It took faith and action for him to get there and it took further action before the miracle happened. Think of the woman with the issue of blood. Did she know she would be healed? Did she know that if she pushed past the crowd, if she crawled and squeezed past everyone, why not go to touch the hand of Jesus? Why just the hem of his garment? She was close enough already. Why not run up and grab Jesus or pull on his garment to get his attention? Well, her faith knew that just the action of touching something on Jesus would be more than enough. Anyone who is speaking the truth will tell you that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven. Anyone who's speaking a lie will tell you things like, God will forgive you regardless of what you do, as long as you love him and you're a good person. That's a lie. But it's a lie with just enough truth to make it sound believable. God will forgive you. That's true. But only if you repent. And to repent is to change, to turn away from sin. And the Bible never mentions anything about good people entering heaven. It's only those who have acknowledged and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Only those who receive Jesus, follow Jesus, and obey Him will see heaven. You see, anyone who is speaking the truth will tell you that following Jesus Christ will not be easy, but it will be oh so rewarding and fulfilling, more so than anything in this world. But someone telling a lie will tell you that God wants you to simply enjoy life, live carefree and in prosperity. But that's simply not true. You see, it's the truth that following Jesus Christ isn't easy. Do you know why? Because Jesus said these words, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Nothing about that says life as a Christian is easy. Denying yourself? Taking up a cross? Do you really know what the cross was symbolic of back in those days? Those listening to Jesus as he spoke these words would have known that the cross was an instrument of Roman torture. The cross was a means of torture and harsh, cruel punishment. But here is Jesus saying, Take up your cross and follow me. The Christian life isn't an easy one. You have to love those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. Forgive those that persecute you. 
you have to be like Christ. Do you know what Christ endured? Do you know how he was rejected, plotted against, spoken against, and viciously opposed? And we are called to be like him? The Christian life is not easy. However, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 5, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. A different translation says, For just as Christ's sufferings are ours in abundance, as they overflow to his followers, so also our comfort, our reassurance, our encouragement, our consolation is abundant through Christ. It is truly more than enough to endure what we must. Whatever we endure in this life is nowhere near the joy and comfort we'll have in heaven when the Lord takes us in his arms. It's not easy following Christ. That's the truth. But it's so very worth it. And that's also the truth. It's not easy following Christ, but you will have the Holy Spirit to empower you, to help you, to teach and guide you. It's not easy following Christ, but you will gain treasures in heaven if you endure to the end. We need knowledge, people. The knowledge to differentiate the truth from a lie. And I believe that it's so important to know the Word of God. Hosea 4 verse 6 My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Really take the time to understand that. A lack of knowledge is what leads to destruction. If you don't know God's Word, if you don't know the truth that is in the Word of God, how will you see through the cloud of deception in this world? How will you survive spiritual warfare? How will you survive spiritual attacks from the devil? Daniel in the Bible is an example of a believer who had knowledge. Daniel prayed to God, but his answer came after three weeks of persistent prayer. Daniel didn't stop praying because he knew who he was up against. He didn't stop praying because he knew what he was up against. But so many believers will pray today and stop praying tomorrow, discouraged, dejected, and defeated, thinking God has not answered their prayer. And that's because there is a lack of knowledge that the answer to your prayer may be under attack. Imagine if Daniel stopped praying after two weeks. Imagine if he quit after a week. A lack of knowledge is dangerous to a Christian. There is a danger to being spiritually ignorant. A Christian who is unaware of God's word, a Christian who is unaware of the need for prayer, that is a powerless person. A lack of knowledge can also be in the area of bad things happening. God allowed the devil to touch Job, and in the end, it was all for his glory. But a lack of knowledge would have said to Job, God has forsaken you. This would never happen if God really loved you. Yet Job was restored to an even better position than before. Another example is Lazarus. God allowed him to die, for his family to grieve. But in the end, it was all for God's glory. But a lack of knowledge would have said, it's all over for Lazarus. God has left him to die. There are so many examples in the Bible where people of God have demonstrated knowledge and faith by not giving up on God. Even if you were to look at Daniel, he was thrown in the lion's den, but he didn't give up on God. Joseph was betrayed, but he didn't give up on God. Bartimaeus was blind, but he still had the knowledge to know that he should call out to Jesus. In all those situations, these were all men and women of God who were in difficult situations. But by standing strong and standing in faith, they demonstrated knowledge. Knowledge that this pain, this illness, this situation will work out for my good and for God's glory. So don't be too quick to point to the devil all the time. Could it be that God is trying to work in you, through you, 
and for your good with this problem? But a lack of knowledge thinks every problem is from the devil. Now, don't get me wrong. Some are attacks from the devil. But some things are God-ordained. And when we understand that, then your prayer will change. Your perspective will change. You're not just praying for this to just pass, but you are praying for God to accomplish His will. You're praying for God to give you more strength. If there's one message that I would want to give you in this season, the season of uncertainty, in this season where fear is prevalent, in this season where the devil is trying to intimidate believers, if I could share with you just one message, it would be this. Now is not the time to give up or throw in the towel. It's not the time for you to throw up your hands and allow yourself to be defeated. I know it feels like times won't get better and that your life is in shambles, but trust in God. He can turn it around. I want to encourage you and let you know that despite what you are going through, God sees you and he hears your earnest cry. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 verse 13, the Lord will make you the head and you will not be the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you this day, and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. You see, children of the Most High God, God loves and cares for His people. Despite what the enemy wants you to believe, God is still on the throne, loving and looking out for His people. I know it seems as if your world is falling apart and the enemy will lead you to believe that things will never turn around, but trust God. God loves us so much that we cannot be separated from His love by these small tests and trials. The enemy wants us to falter in our faith and allow his spirit of defeat to take over. But the devil is a liar, and he is the one that is defeated. The Bible says in Romans 8, verses 35 through 37, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you know that these trials of our faith come to make us strong? Yes, we as people of God must endure hard trials sometimes. We must grow in our faith, people of God. How can we expect to be able to know God and never experience truly knowing God? How can we be witnesses of His excellent mercy and kindness unless we experience it firsthand? How can we say that we love and serve a God that is more than enough if we don't experience His mighty hand of deliverance for ourselves? Just because we are children of the King does not mean that we will walk on a bed of roses. It doesn't mean that we get a get-out-of-jail-free card all the time. Sometimes we must endure hardship as a good soldier. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The Lord wants us to be well-rounded. He doesn't want His saints to be spoiled brats. Can you imagine getting everything you wanted all the time? We would never be able to appreciate anything. We would be just like kids that always get what they want and then pitch a fit when we're told no. God does not want us like that. Being children of God does not make us immune to the sufferings of this world. This reminds me of a man in the Bible who feared God and walked up brightly before him and hated evil. His name was Job. Job was very wealthy and had seven sons and three beautiful daughters. He was a man with perfect character. He prayed for his family daily, even asking God for forgiveness of sins that they may have committed. Now, 
The adversary, as usual, hates the people of God. He cannot stand us and is always seeking whom he may devour. However, God loved Job and even bragged on him to the devil. He said that there was none like Job in all the earth. He was honest, hated evil, and was a man of absolute integrity. So, the devil told God, of course he does. He doesn't serve and fear you for nothing. You put a hedge about him in its house and everything he owns. You even blessed everything he puts his hands to do and made him very wealthy. If you take everything away from him, he will curse you to your face. The Lord told Satan, all right, everything that he has is in your hands now. However, you are not allowed to take his life. Of course, the devil did his absolute worst. All in one day, Job lost his sons and his daughters, servants and cattle. Job couldn't even catch his breath because the bad news kept coming back to back. Do you know what Job did? He got on his knees and worshipped. He blessed the name of the Lord and did not sin or curse God. This made the devil even more angry, so he went to God again and asked could he make Job sick. God allowed it, but told the devil again that he may not take his life. Of course, the devil did his worst and gave Job great boils all over his skin, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. It was so bad that even his wife told Job to curse God and die. He looked so awful that even his friends did not recognize him. In all of this, Job said, Shall we only receive good from God and not bad? Now, Job being human did feel sorry for himself and even cursed the day he was born. But in all of this, he still did not curse God. In the end, despite all that the adversary did to him, God blessed him with double for his trouble. He received more cattle than he had before, had more beautiful children, and all his wealth was increased even more. Sometimes this is just like what happens in our lives. Saints, God knows all and he sees all. Could it be that the Lord is testing your faith? Could it be that the devil sees how much you love God and the Lord himself mentions you by name because of your faithfulness to him? My brothers and sisters, we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. We are more than conquerors through Christ that loves us. Thank God that he has provided us godly examples of real people in the Bible that have gone through the fire and came out as pure gold. It is because of examples like Job that helped give me hope during the testing of my faith. I know what it feels like to go through and feel like, when will it be my turn? Some of you right now are experiencing this very thought. I am here to encourage you and let you know to be of good courage for God will strengthen your heart. God knows where you are and he knows when you have suffered long enough. He will not allow you to continue to be on the bottom. He loves you too much. The Bible says that we are the head only and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. Lift up your head, children of God, because he loves you and he wants to see you succeed. We may have to go through the fire and the flood, but rest assured that he sees you right where you are. Trust God and in his word. Stand firm on the promises of God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Oh, what blessed assurance. I want you to know that we are not without hope like the children in the world that do not know God. Your Father in heaven owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Your Father in heaven sits on the circle of the earth and judges the just and the unjust. The Lord your God is the one who called this earth into being and placed the stars in space. Don't you know the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous? We are not without hope, people of God. Jesus loves you and cares for you. He wants to see his people prosper. It gives him joy when we are happy. Yes, we may have to cry sometimes, but trouble does not last always. 
So lift up your heads, saints of the Most High God. The best is yet to come. Don't give up. As humans who have physical bodies that are prone to injury or illness, we all sense if something is physically wrong with us by paying attention to any signs or symptoms like pain that may suggest that something is wrong. The usual thing that follows is a trip to the doctor for examination. That way, we can receive the appropriate treatment that would allow us to heal from whatever condition or illness we might be suffering from. Now, do we do this for our spirits also? Here's a question for you. Have you ever sat down and examined your spirit when something felt a little off? I mean, really, really reflected on the condition of your soul, the condition of your heart, of your mind. Why did that make me feel so angry? Where did those thoughts come from? What really caused me to feel so troubled? These are questions that we ought to be asking ourselves whenever we feel something that's contrary to the Word of God. Sometimes as Christians, we seem to live our lives as if all is well. And some of us can actually convince ourselves that we're happy. However, if we actually pay attention to what is happening on a deeper level, we would soon realize that there are all sorts of issues that need to be dealt with. Issues that cause spiritual infirmity. All of us should be sensitive to the signs in our lives that tell us we need healing. These signs manifest themselves in different ways. If we are objective, if we're honest, and if we truly examine ourselves against the standard of the Word of God, we'd begin to pick out, Oh, I have a heart issue. Someone hurt me and now I feel entitled to sympathy or attention. True reflection is when you sit down and notice, I have a mind issue. My thoughts right now are dirty and impure. And then as you dig a little deeper, you find that they are impure and dirty because you're spending so much time listening to music that talks of making love, having sex, and all kinds of things. That's what you're feeding your mind. And what you feed will grow. And as it grows, it becomes an issue. And these issues include bitterness, unforgiveness, grudges, and so on. Having any of these issues points to the fact that we need to be delivered from them. We need to be healed from them. You see, without inviting the Lord in for deliverance or healing, we are unable to mature or grow spiritually because we are stuck in a place of affliction and cannot possibly have joy in its true sense, as Christ commands us to. True and lasting healing can only come from the ultimate healer, Jesus Christ. Should you find yourself always in regret or beating yourself up about past mistakes, that's a sign you need healing. Should you find yourself to always be getting angry at everybody who doesn't share your view or share your opinion, that's a sign that you need healing. If you find joy in putting others down or gossiping about others, that's actually a sign that you yourself need healing. These can all be issues of hurt, low self-esteem, or bitterness. All of these can only be healed by Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, when you find someone who can't forgive, someone who won't forgive, that person usually has wounds or scars that have been left unattended. Unforgiveness is a sign that a person needs healing in one or more areas in their own life. During Jesus' ministry, one of the main points he focused on was forgiveness. He taught his followers to pray by saying, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those 
who trespassed against us. And so now for us as believers, we can be certain that forgiving others is not just something we can choose to do. It is something we must do. And it would be disobedient to God if we were to be unforgiving towards others. But to what extent does God want us to forgive? How many times? Well, Peter asked Jesus the same question in Matthew 18, verse 21 to 22, which says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Now you might be thinking, why is God so insistent that we forgive people who hurt us? Why so many times, Lord? Seventy? Seven times? If they did it the first time, okay. But if they kept hurting me, why do I have to keep forgiving? Does the Lord not care about our pain? However, let me tell you, God wanting us to forgive is all about how much He cares for us. He loves us so much that He doesn't want us having any bitterness or resentment in our hearts because that would make our lives miserable. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment festers in the heart and in the soul. It grows and corrupts you from the inside out. That's why I believe the Lord wants us to forgive so often and so freely. I believe that the Lord would also have us forgive so freely and often is because He also wants us to be like Him. Jesus, the Son of God, one who was blameless and pure, died on the cross and forgave us even while we were sinning against Him. So who are we that we shouldn't forgive others? When you harbor unforgiveness, this should be a sign to you that there is something unresolved within you because if you have received mercy from the Lord, why would you refuse to forgive others? If the Lord has forgiven you for all that you have done, then who are you to make the decision not to forgive someone else? I believe that unforgiveness is a sign you need healing from the Lord because you cannot expect to receive mercy, but place yourself at a moral high ground when it comes to forgiving others. Take a good look at yourself. Is there anything in your life that is an indication that you need healing? Is there pain from your past that's unresolved? Is there regret from previous mistakes that has grown and grown into something else? Only the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can give you true and lasting healing. James chapter 1 verse 22 to 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The challenge is to be a doer of the word rather than just hearing about God's word. Saints, when we go before God with a heart humble and surrendered, that's where transformation can take place in His presence. It's a place where we can be honest about what we're lacking and where we need to improve. We don't have to be slaves to our flesh anymore. We don't have to be trapped and caught up in a cycle of sin. 
God has called us out of that lifestyle and he has called us to so much more. He's called us to higher things. He's called us to be his children, to love him and to be loved. Sin is the only thing separating you from God. The question is, will you keep living in darkness? Will you keep living in that cycle? Or will you today call upon the name of Jesus? Will you today ask the Lord Almighty to break those cycles of sin in your life? Think carefully, because when you do call on him, once you take that step, you will never be the same. You will experience true deliverance, true freedom. Any chains holding you down are destroyed. So break that cycle. Choose God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 and 32. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Have you ever judged yourself? Have you ever critiqued your own life? Have you ever honestly and objectively assessed? Does my faith please God? Am I a faithful believer to the Lord? Do I seek first the kingdom of God? Am I really bearing good fruit? You see, self-reflection is important in every area of life, and it's particularly important in a believer's life. But the demands of this life can keep us from self-reflection. You see, life has a way of pushing us forward by all its demands. But it's so important for us to look into the mirror and hold up the standard, which is the Word of God, and then compare ourselves and see how do we match up. Because if the Bible says, pray without ceasing, but you can clearly see in your own life that you don't pray, well then, now you have something to go before God about. Now you have a prayer request, which should be, Lord, help me to pray consistently. Do you see how self-reflection can help you? God wants us to be real and honest, and he wants us to look closely into that mirror from time to time and examine ourselves. How's our character? What's our lifestyle like? Are we living in a manner that is pleasing to God? Are we gaining victory over those private battles that we all face? Now here's why the Word of God is powerful. When you read it, it acts like, like a mirror. And when you read God's Word, you need to be asking yourself, is this real to me? Am I living this truth in my life? James chapter 1 verse 22 to 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The challenge is to be a doer of the word rather than just hearing about God's word. Saints, when we go before God with a heart humbled, and surrendered, that's where transformation can take place in His presence. It's a place where we can be honest about what we're lacking and where we need to improve. I have a friend who always asks me the question, what would Jesus do whenever I'm faced with a tough situation or a choice to make? What would Jesus do? 
And although it's a good question, I think the better question to be asking is, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when he was on earth and faced difficult circumstances? What did he do when he needed guidance, strength, or before a big event? The answer is, he prayed. The Bible says in Matthew 14, verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. Then if you go over to Mark chapter 6, verse 46, the Bible reads, And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now if that wasn't enough, Luke 6, verse 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Many times in the Bible we're told Jesus prayed. That's what our Lord did. He went to the mountain to pray. He went into isolation to pray. He went to a private place to pray. Jesus prayed often and consistently. He prayed early in the morning, late at night, all through the night. He prayed in every aspect of life. So now the question has moved from, what would Jesus do, to what did Jesus do? And now the question is, what are you doing? We know that our Lord prayed. He prayed persistently and relentlessly. Can we say the same about our own prayer lives? Are you going into isolation to pray? Are you going into a private place to pray? Just like Jesus, are you praying early in the morning? Are you praying late at night? The example that Jesus set for us was prayer. The Bible says he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Proper prayer requires us to have a truthful understanding of God and what He has revealed to us through His Word. In the life of a believer, there is absolutely nothing more important in life than to learn how to pray, because prayer is the most powerful thing we can learn how to do. Prayer is where we communicate with God. It's where we connect with Him. Several passages in the Bible call us to pray, to pray continually. Romans 12:12 12, 12 says, "Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer." Philippians 4:6 says, "Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God." We're even told in Colossians to devote, devote ourselves to prayer. So in every aspect of life, we are encouraged to pray. Prayer is an act of obedience. If we are to be obedient to His will, then prayer must be part of our life in Him. God calls us to pray, and we must respond.